You're listening to Live from Lord North Street, a podcast from the Institute of Economic Affairs. Left-wing movements in Britain and further afield are increasingly citing the Scandinavian or Nordic economic model as a desirable alternative to capitalism. But is Scandinavian socialism really all it's cracked up to be? Today, Dr Steve Davies and Kate Andrews of the IEA put the Nordic model under the spotlight and examine to what extent these countries are indeed socialist or even left-wing. If you like what you hear, subscribe to our iTunes channel, IEA Conversations. Steve, as politics are realigning in the West, there's more and more talk of the Scandinavian countries, which from the far left's perspective are put up as something to emulate. What's actually happening up there? Well, not what many people outside in the UK and elsewhere project onto them. There's a kind of notion in certain parts of the left that Sweden, for example, uh, or maybe Norway, is a kind of socialist paradise. And by that is meant a state where the state has an extremely active hands-on role in planning and running the economy. There's a very collectivist kind of society uh, and there's a sort of absence of free market capitalism, really, a different kind of political economy. Now, Certain elements of that are true, but the broad picture is false. And it hasn't really been true of Scandinavian countries since certainly the early 1990s or arguably even the mid to late 1980s. There was a brief period between the 1970s and the 1980s, roughly, when that was indeed true. Uh, During that period, there was a huge growth in the size of uh, the state in most Scandinavian countries, and there were moves to have the state take over a significant part of the productive assets of the economy. This, however, has actually been pushed back significantly. So what you've seen emerge is a quite different kind of political economy, which is significantly different, to be fair, from uh, the kind of political and economic system that we have in, say, the United States, Canada, Great Britain, or some other European countries, but which is not the kind of socialist world that, say, the left wing of the Labour Party imagine it to be. Their fundamental proposal is that these countries are rejecting capitalism significantly more than, say, we are here in the UK or over in the US. But other reports would suggest that these countries are using capitalism in order to fund and perpetuate certain elements of the welfare state. That's part of what's going on. The thing to understand and realise is that by a number of criteria, uh, Scandinavian countries such as Sweden are more free market and more capitalist than, say, the United States. Sweden, to take the uh, quintessential case, has an extremely efficient free market economy. The state does not own much in the way of productive enterprises or companies. The economy is significantly less regulated than either the United States or the United Kingdom, both in terms of the number and scope of the regulations that the Swedish government issues, but also in terms of the kind of regulations that it issues, which is even more important in some ways. Scandinavian social democracies typically tend, and this is particularly true in the case of uh, Finland, Sweden and Norway, they tend to issue regulations which are very general. They're, if you like, principles rather than the kind of very, very detailed, minutely fine-grained regulations that US government regulatory agencies or UK government tends to issue. Regulations of that kind have a much less damaging effect upon economic activity because they're much easier to comply with. And so, essentially, what you have in Scandinavia is actually more of a free market economy in many ways than you find in countries that are thought to be quintessential essentially capitalist, such as the United States. However, what you also do have, and this is uh, what the observers notice, of course, is very high levels of taxation. VAT in Sweden is 25%, for example. You also have very high provision of welfare benefits and services by the state. So the Swedish state uh, provides uh, very low-cost childcare, for example, funded through taxation. Uh, There are lots and lots of benefits given, big difference between the Scandinavian welfare state and the welfare state found in the Anglo-Saxon countries. These benefits are given on a universal basis, whereas in the Anglo-Saxon countries, they typically are means tested. Now, that means that the uh, benefits given in Scandinavia are much less economically damaging because they do not create the very powerful perverse incentive effects that means-tested benefits create, such as poverty traps and employment traps, where you find that if you're in receipt of a benefit, you're actually worse off or at best no better off if you work more or actually take a job. By contrast, in the Scandinavian case, because they're not means-tested, that is not true. Uh, That does mean, of course, that Scandinavian welfare states are much less redistributive 
than the British welfare state, which is not what most people on the left here realise. Uh, they tend to think that Scandinavian states engage in a lot of redistribution. In fact, they do not. It's true they're much more egalitarian than Britain, but that's not because of redistribution. It's because they have a more egalitarian income distribution in the first place. And this has been the case for a very long time. That's fascinating. Why is that? Well, it's very hard to say, actually. It's one of those historical phenomena that you can clearly observe and trace, but explaining it proves to be a bit more of a challenge. Sweden has basically had a much more egalitarian income distribution than the United Kingdom, for example, since really the 1890s, as far as we can tell. It's hard to tell before then because the records aren't that good. Why is this? Well, one possible reason is greater cultural and ethnic homogeneity. Now, what that means is that you have a society in which there is very high levels of trust, very high levels of social cooperation. And one of the knock-on effects of that, it's argued, is that typically you don't start to get a, the more individualistic kind of society which manifests itself in quite significant income differentials. Uh, that's, that's one possibility. Another possibility is, bec- is that it's because Scandinavian societies typically do not have a very large financial services sector or a very large sector based around law or the media or sport and entertainment. There obviously are such sectors, but proportionally they're not as important, it's argued, as they are in, say, the United States or Great Britain. And those kinds of jobs tend to bring the really high salary. Yes, uh, those kind of jobs, law, entertainment, leisure, financial services, all have very pronounced winner-take-all income distributions. So you have very small numbers of people who get enormously high incomes. By contrast, in Scandinavia, you have a large general service sector, a continuing fairly significant industrial manufacturing sector, and some primary production, obviously oil in the case of Norway, iron ore, a number of other things, in, such as timber in the case of Finland and Sweden. These are industries where actually the long-term trend appears to be towards narrowing of income differentials uh, and much less, in fact, almost no evidence of the really pronounced winner-take-all effect that you get, say, in financial services. So that's another possible explanation. But I think it's fair to say that none of these explanations is fully persuasive. So as the old saying has it, we need more research, really. It's just quite striking that Uh, These societies, like Japan, another case, are much more egalitarian in their income distribution uh, than other European countries. And it's not just the Anglo-Saxon countries. France, for example, has a very unequal distribution of income. But this might, does this help to explain why perhaps the Scandinavian countries are held up by the left in the UK? They would like to see more egalitarian distribution of salary across the board, but here in the UK, you would have to go to great lengths to implement that. You'd have to have seriously higher taxes to redistribute more wealth, or you'd have to go for something even more radical, like a maximum wage. Whereas in the Scandinavian countries, it's happening organically. You're not getting all the consequences that come along with intervening in the economy like that. Yes, exactly. The point is, people look at Scandinavia, uh, at Sweden or Norway, and they see very narrow income differentials, much greater income equality as compared to the UK, and they think, oh, I like that. And they then have a mistaken idea of how this has been done. They think it's been done through a redistributive welfare state, when in fact it's actually done by having a very productive economy plus universal benefits which do not redistribute and also, as I said, some kind of structural feature of those societies that seems to produce not so many really high incomes at the top and also not so much of a large class of people who are very poorly paid at the bottom. K, if you try to do it through a redistributive welfare state, almost certainly that would not work. You would just simply slow down economic growth and you'd actually end up making everybody worse off. You might go even more radically and argue that the way to do it is to actually have good old-fashioned red-blooded socialism and have the state take over the productive side of the economy. But that, again, would almost certainly be an economic disaster. And And so, what they do in Scandinavia. Yeah, and that's not what they do in Scandinavia anyway, because they have actually, as I said, a much more free market economy than uh, than we do. Well, this is one of the problems isn't it, that countries like Venezuela and Scandinavia have somehow in many people's minds been lumped together as alternatives, and yet these kinds of countries couldn't be further apart. Absolutely. I mean, Venezuela is obviously the classic sort of lesson in what not to do, and it's a totally different kind of model. I mean, Venezuela is a classic state-controlled socialist economy. The state has nationalized large uh, numbers of firms. In particular, it's followed a disastrous policy of imposing strict price ceilings on a whole range of regular consumer goods, which means that these goods cannot be sold for, in many cases, less than the cost of production. And, you know, 
surprise, surprise, what anyone who's taken about 10 minutes of economics could tell you would happen has happened, and you've had catastrophic shortages and a complete collapse of economic activity. Now, uh, even at the height of their socialist phase in the 1970s and 1980s, the Scandinavians never messed around with the price system. So you're talking about something quite different here, and it's quite wrong to actually lump these two things together and to imply, as some unthinking people do, that there's, they're both part of the same alternative to uh, the system we have here. Putting tampering with salaries aside, is there just a fundamental difference in demographics and immigration patterns, which means that Scandinavia is always going to look different in its policies than places like Great Britain? Not necessarily. One of the striking features of the recent history of Scandinavian countries, of course, has been extremely high levels of immigration. Uh, Sweden now has pretty close to the uh, European average for non-foreign-born residents. It's about 14 to 15 percent, uh, if my memory serves me rightly. Denmark, about the same. Norway and Finland, similar kind of figures. And there are signs that this may be undermining the kind of social solidarity that was such a striking feature of these societies for the bulk of the 20th century. The kind of ideology of the national home, which was such a powerful feature of Swedish social democracy, has, I think, been significantly undermined. And one of the consequences of this, I'm afraid, of a society like that facing significant immigration is that it's led to the appearance of a very unpleasant kind of right-wing populist uh, politics in the shape of, for example, the Sweden Democrats or the Danish People's Party. These are parties who combine very aggressive and hostile attitudes towards immigration and many immigrants with a strong commitment to maintaining the indigenous welfare state and actually support for quite an active uh, and expansive role for government. So it's the worst possible combination of policies from my point of view. Now, Interestingly, countries like the United Kingdom or the US, while they undoubtedly have problems with immigration, I think actually they are better positioned to deal with population flows and migration than previously homogeneous societies like the Scandinavian ones, where that very homogeneity is so closely linked to and tied in with their particular political and economic model. So I think that the kind of large-scale movements of people that we're seeing at the moment in Europe and elsewhere are going to have a much more profound effect and probably a bad effect, I have to say, in terms of the resulting politics in Scandinavia than they are in the UK. Is there anything that people on the right, people from a free market capitalist perspective, can learn then from Scandinavia? No, there are a number of things we could we could learn, definitely. One of them is perhaps that if you are going to have a welfare state, then you should definitely go for universal benefits rather than means-tested ones. The damaging effects of means-tested benefits are so obvious and so extensive that I think that's a very powerful lesson to learn. Another one is that we should change the way we regulate the economy. Scandinavian countries like Sweden have a much better system of regulation than either the United States or the United Kingdom. And they have looser labour laws, I believe. I'm pretty sure that Sweden doesn't have a minimum wage. No, it doesn't. And yeah. it, it has much more relaxed uh, labour market regulations. But now, that's not how we would think of no, Sweden. No, absolutely. Yeah. But it's interesting, and this is perhaps a controversial thing for somebody to say from a free market perspective, but I think that one of the reasons for that is actually because uh, organized labor in Sweden, the LO as it's called, is still pretty powerful and extensive. And what that means is that if the regulators or the uh, government are making regulations, they don't need to go into the really fine ins and outs of every detail. They can basically make much more general broad brush regulations and leave it up to local managers and local union officials to work out the details at an industry-wide or even a plant-wide level. And of course, those people, the union reps and the local managers, they have the local knowledge, which means they know what is going to be the most effective way of doing it, meeting whatever the goals that the regulations set are. Instead, in the UK and the US and several other countries, I have to say, we have the ridiculous attempt to try and predict and cover every single imaginable possible outcome, which, of course, is a theoretical impossibility and means you end up with enormously long and vastly complicated regulatory systems, which are hugely intrusive and which also lend themselves to produce a capture by special interest groups, particular se economic sectors or interests, in a way that the more general model of regulation employed in Scandinavia does not. So that's, that's definitely an area where we can learn. So if Scandinavia isn't this socialist utopia that many on the left would like to make it out to be, where does it sit on the political With a pretty sector? extensive role for government in providing a range of social services, the aim of which is to enable people to 
fulfill their life projects, but also to maintain a broad sense of social cohesion and social and economic equality. Now, that's a different kind of economic model from the one we have, say, in the UK or other parts of the Anglo-Saxon world, or indeed the model that you have maybe in Germany, uh, which is much more, I think, uh, communalist and collectivist than the Scandinavian one. But that's what I would describe it as. So it's a kind of capitalism and a very free market economy combined with a pretty specific but still quite large role for the state and public spending in terms of maintaining social cohesion and, and equality. I think you've debunked quite a few myths there, Steve. Thank you so much. For more podcasts, blogs, reports and films, go to our website, iea.org.uk.